So for the next part of our program, uh, we're going to welcome up Rob Vermey. He is the head of operations of Exxon. Uh, he started as a second employee, and he leads a team using NIME to elevate aircraft data processes. Welcome, Rob. Thanks, Sasha. Thanks for inviting me here. Yeah, thanks for coming all the way from the Netherlands. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> OK, over to you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, hello, everybody. And my name is uh, Rob. I'm from Action AVA Solutions. So don't have to tell you which industry that is. Uh, and today I'm here to talk a bit on uh, how NIME helped us to uh, realize some of our ideas for the industry. But before I go into that, I quickly want to introduce ourselves as a company. For m I think most of you didn't hear from us outside of the industry. Um, we're a company. Uh, supporting uh, the engineering and maintenance uh, section uh, within aviation uh, yeah, in, in managing uh, aircraft, or what we call in industry terms, airworthiness data, uh, and get the most out of it and further uh, yeah, generate improvements from that process. And we do that with a very dedicated team of uh, aviation engineers based in Amsterdam who have a big passion for uh, anything data related uh, and we always prof profile ourselves as uh, the bridge between aviation and IT solutions. Um, and we do that because we really believe digital solutions can help our industry uh, forward uh, both from an efficiency standpoint but also especially from a human error standpoint um, and that's a specific uh, sensitive topic, obviously, when talking about an aircraft. And like so many, uh, I guess, here at NIME, but also in the audience, uh, we also see that technologies uh, rapidly uh, outpacing some of our own capabilities, and we'd like to be at the forefront uh, of introducing that uh, into the aviation industry. Um, and we do that at the moment with some of what we call our aircraft data operations platform, which is based on three pillars. The Nexus solution is really focusing on managing the aircraft data, doing the grunt work, uh, transforming the data in something usable. We then uh, can tackle with our other solutions, analytics, to yeah, get value that from that and, and drive business decisions uh, and do some more advanced predictive analysis on the data. And yeah, we're always there to support our customers, so we have a big portfolio of consultancy services. And just as a last slide for our introduction, this is uh, a quick overview of uh, many of the customers we serve all over the globe. And all the airlines on here will always face the problem I'm going to talk about today, uh, at least once in their life, hopefully more, otherwise uh, they might have a problem, uh, which is called an aircraft face-in. And today I'm going to talk about how we've managed to reduce that process from a uh, from quite a lengthy process to, to a very short and almost fun thing to do. Um, before I go into the nitty gritty of stuff, I like to obviously explain a bit what is an aircraft facing. Um, it's basically in, the, in buying a new airplane, either from the manufacturer or uh, from a previous owner, very similar to buying a new or an old car. But unlike a new or old car, you get the keys and you drive away. Before an airline can fly with an aircraft, they need to go through a whole process. And for the engineering uh, team, that means the process of uh, taking, of transferring the responsibility from the previous owner uh, of, of what we call continuous awareness of the aircraft. I mean, as a passenger, you'd like to know that your aircraft is safe. And the authorities also like to uh, make sure the aircraft is safe. Um, and the engineering team is really responsible for, for that part. And they, that airworthiness is determined by uh, the history of maintenance and ultimately that leads into the current status of the aircraft. Uh, yeah, if that's been properly followed and every action has been properly taken, that will determine if an aircraft is airworthy. And Unfortunately, for a lot of engineers around the world, it's still a very manual process. So they have to really do a, a, a due diligence check on all that history. And in the previous slide, you saw that could go back 20, 30 years if you're talking about older aircraft. 
and they really have to dive into that. And then the, the next burden they are getting is that they need to face in not only into the airline itself, but that also means facing it into their maintenance systems where they uh, track uh, the maintenance of the aircraft to make sure it's airworthiness and they, and they uh, have that responsibility uh, covered. Um, like uh, Sasha and Phil said before, uh, also in aviation, Excel is generally the tool uh, people get, and that's it. Um, and then next to that, they have quite a limited time to do it. So four weeks is sort of the minimum to do sort of a, a proper job in the industry, and airline managers like to, of course, hold an engineering team to that, because they'd like to fly the aircraft. Flying the aircraft makes the money, not an aircraft having sitting on the ground waiting on an engineering team. So because of those time limitations, uh, yeah, what you see is m not always the whole history of the aircraft can be checked before it's flying. And that obviously can have some implications and some things being missed out that might be important. The other th side of things is that, again, they need to phase things into their systems. So uh, they always phase where they, they get something from a from a happy seller that, that's glad he got rid of the aircraft and puts minimal effort in, in uh, providing at least the data that's required, and they need to somehow get that into their system. And that's a very repetitive job. Again, it's manual, uh, and engineers generally don't really enjoy it. It's not really engineering. It's not why they went into business. Uh, and on the other side, engineers are not the lowest paid staff in an airline. So the process itself for four weeks is already quite costly. If we do a rough estimate, it might be already going to a 30,000 euros purely staffing costs. We don't talk about any other costs. Um, and then there's always the whole aspect of human error. Uh, everybody makes mistakes. Uh, there are people that like, don't like to admit that, but it's very human, very natural. Uh, but we're now talking about airplanes, and those mistakes can have some consequences. Um, if you're lucky, and I'm going to use a curse word in the aviation industry, uh, it sticks to a normal aircraft on ground situation. What means aircraft on ground? Literally what it says, the aircraft is unscheduled, standing on the ground while it's supposed to be flying and making money. Well, that can ramp up quite quickly in costs, but there is also, in very extreme cases, another aircraft on ground situation, if someone overlooked something which I think everyone wants to avoid. Um, and that's why uh, we thought, with what I said previously, a bunch of very dedicated engineers that are really seeing the benefits of digital solutions, we said, let's introduce uh, the concept of ETL within this process. Um, and actually, that fared initially quite well, uh, because we could really uh, yeah, reduce also reduce the time, but also meanwhile process all of the data. The engineers were happy because they didn't have to look ev at everything line by line, but they just start to, to have to look to exception reports, so to the real engineering, to the real things they they might be interested in to figure out. Uh, and obviously, uh, things are not touched as much anymore by human hands, so there was also less risk of human error. Um, however, for us, that was a nah, nice new source of income, but later we realized we were transferring a lot of the problems the engineers faced to our own team, our own colleagues, um, because we had to custom build ETL scripts for every project or every phasing we did. Uh, we had to yeah, basically do that for every single phasing, which are, is still a similar quite similar process. Uh, doesn't really matter which aircraft, they all need to uh, adhere to the same standards. Um, and we had a big risk, and not it didn't stay with a risk, it actually happened quite often, where we were reinventing the wheel. So some people uh, were working on one aircraft, other colleagues were working on other aircraft, and they were basically trying to solve the, their own, uh, the same problem. So. These were my colleagues during that time. Uh, then the pandemic came, 
uh, not a great time to be in aviation, <laughs> to be very honest. Um, and uh, at that point in time, we were, yeah, we, we, we wanted to do something with that reduced workload we had, and we started looking around. And we ended up with a company, somebody, some people here might know, it's Nine. <laughs> um, and in Nine, we found some tool sets we could now really use to enable a lot of the ideas we're already starting to have around this process, how to, to get rid of all the repetitiveness and how to make it easier to use for everyone, both in our company and also for our customers. So we looked at what does this, how, 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 what does this process, how is it made, why is it so repetitive? What, what makes it so repetitive? And like any generic ETL process, there were only limited steps we're actually going through. So only we obviously have an input side and an output side, but also from an aircraft perspective where we did the validations and all the, the analysis to, to get the aircraft in the right shape and form into the system, the steps are always the same and well stipulated. The trick is always the same. Then we also have the benefit of, in the aviation, there is rather a limited selection of systems, either where data comes from or data goes through. So it became quite predictable. And the engineers are always asking and want to see the same sort of data as a form of exception report, because that's what they need to look at, that's what they need to check, and that's what makes an aircraft airworthy. So we saw all these, well, you heard the term earlier, puzzle pieces, and NIME had a great solution uh, for us in that case, which in the form of a component or a meta note, which Phil earlier explained a little bit. So what that meant for us when the months were progressing and we did more and more phase in projects, we started to identify all these puzzle pieces and package them into a component and a, or, no, of a met, or meta notes. Uh, quick example, this is uh, a workflow that validates the aircraft utilization, which is the history of flight records, just to make sure they're all in the right order, in the sequence, and there's no weird entries. Well, that's already getting a bit more complex workflow, which if you have to recreate it by hand every time, takes a lot of time, and people might do it in different ways, which are not always optimal. And this is what it is now. Simple one component. Another example was, for example, the output. So we know to which systems we generally need to output. They always require certain sequences, certain dependencies, certain consistency across files, certain structures. Again, become a quite a complex thing, but always the same. And that turned into one component, one piece of the puzzle. So along the road, we get, got so many pieces of the puzzle that we could start packages these, package these very easily into uh, yeah, a logical sequence that represented exactly how an engineer would see the phasing process. And that resulted into workflows like this, where on the left we have some input sources, we do a little bit of cleaning uh, in the middle to pass the data to one component at the end, which in itself is built, again, out of some more puzzle pieces uh, to handle a phase-in, in this case, a mains program. Um, but then we came, uh, then we also wanted to ensure we, didn't, we don't need to repeat this for every single customer we have, because they might have their own rules, their own ideas, their own uh, need for, for reports. So we made sure all those puzzle pieces we made were, we made them once and once only, and made them configurable to what a customer would normally ask from us. So we used configuration nodes and variables to basically make, yeah, only give the components some important information and the rest would be handled in the logic we uh, put behind it and make sure things are uh, as we would expect them. And then we, um, with that, we basically started to create our own NIME node repository, so, but then in the form of components in Metano. So we used the NIME server uh, to really structure all these puzzle pieces in a very logical way that uh, would solve certain engineering business requirements for all our pro projects and processes regarding a phase-in. And we made sure we linked them into the workflows where they were used, because 
with a linked component in NIME, um, once we identify one component could be tweaked, could be slightly better, uh, we can deploy that back to the server and all the workflows where that component was linked in will automatically update and benefit from, it, from those additional tweaks and those additional uh, improvements that we made. So along the process, we were building better and better components and all the old workflows we built before for whatever phasing we did uh, were updated automatically. Uh, obviously, this requires some control, uh, so we made sure only certain people can deploy it after thorough testing. But anyway, it helped really to create visibility, uh, what was available to the, whole, to, to the whole team, and also make sure that we stopped reinventing the wheel. But then some of my colleagues like to, well, they call it work effectively. <laughs> and basically, they'd like to go home earlier, if possible. Uh, they said, well, why are we configuring those things still ourselves? Uh, I thought we were all about digital solutions and automation. Yeah, we thought, well, they were actually right. Um, so we took our uh, co existing customer database that was driving our customer portal, which we call my action, and we actually started to introduce uh, uh, sections in the, in the database, especially for customer projects, to lock certain requirements for certain projects and phase-ins. Um, and we linked them, and we made sure they were the components were able to link uh, to those. So basically, we now only need to say uh, for which customer workflow is ran, uh, and it will completely configure itself. Again, the puzzle pieces will be all in the right place, rightly configured, uh, and our hands are sort of clean. And that really opened the door to even do, try to do less from our side <laughs> and say, well, why don't we let our customers handle the whole process. Why, why, why would we keep doing something, again, repetitive, even though the, the effort was already minimal, why can we not give that into the hands of our customers? Um, again, we had NIME. So NIME has something that's called the NIME web portal. And we start to, well, abuse it, misuse it, however you want to name it, for, for, uh, for this exact purpose. Um, we gave uh, customers uh, direct access to pre prepared aircraft facing workflows. Based on the customer user that's logged in, we can then determine the right settings for their facing, or for in this case, what we, we call the internal project. Uh, they upload a certain piece of data um, in a certain pre configured formats we already have for them. Again, import of input systems are fairly limited. Um, type in a new aircraft registration and off NIME goes into the backend. Then we'll provide an overview to a customer which validations were passed, which are not, might require some attention, might require real engineering, so they can download those exception reports, and we gave them the import files to directly uh, face the aircraft into whatever system they were using. Again, that was already pre-configured. Um, so in short, uh, with this, we really were able to uh, slice the phase in time to sort of two days. And the biggest uh, challenge we overcame was to package all that ETL and data logic in puzzle pieces that were really relatable to ourselves, to maybe some uh, less experienced team members, but also to our customers. So we were, you were talking again the same language. You were really putting focus back on aircraft engineering and not on the programming side of things. Our customers are now really fully empowered to run uh, phase-ins themselves if they want to, um, independent of our planning. So we don't have to plan a, pl give them uh, a planning when can we help them. Um, but also from our side, that in turn allowed us that we can be much more efficient with our resources. Uh, and manage actually multiple projects with the same people. Again, we did, don't have to do much as much anymore. Um, so I, to indicate before, it took us maybe 10, 15 days to customize a script for, for an aircraft phase in, and now that can be done in one, if, one, if, uh, one or two days in, in case a customer decides not to do a full self-service solution. And maybe the biggest benefit of all for us, but ultimately also for our customer was that also from our side, 
it went back to using our brain power, so using our engineering knowledge, using our knowledge of data science and data uh, management, put it into further development of next solutions and the next steps instead of doing things over and over again. So with that, I uh, yeah, that, that I hope you enjoyed our case. Um, maybe it hopefully gave some ideas for, for your own industry. And again, thanks very much, Sasha, for inviting me. Thank you, Rob. Uh, I loved that story, and I knew that you had to share it as soon as I heard it. Uh, and uh, we'll see you back here for the Q&A. Yeah, well done. Thanks okay. very much.